Wow, it's so exciting to be here. I have just fallen in love with Utah. I, you know, I, was, I went to Antelope Island yesterday and I just kind of lost it. So watch out because I could just spin into the madness of my feelings about the ephemerality of the state of Utah at any given moment during this lecture. Um, and I will want to reference something very specific to you about something that happened to me yesterday. Coming up the road right outside of Ogden, and I had just come from Antelope Island in the middle of this incredible storm, and you know I was I was I was just feeling the power of nature here that is so profound, and it's not that profound in Brooklyn, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> other things are profound, but not nature. Um, and I was coming up, you know, up the road, uh, up uh, 15, and I came around the bend, and this giant rainbow stalk just was crashed down right on to the earth, you know, off to my right, just coloring the entire landscape with, you know, yellow and red and violet and blue. And I had never, and I swear to this, I never have seen a thick rainbow like that. It was so wide and each spectrum like, I never have seen violet like I saw yesterday. I mean, violet that was so bright and brilliant. And I was just, you know, I couldn't pull off though. I was, you know, I was in rush hour traffic outside of Ogden and I was kind of having to keep going, but my eyes were on that rainbow. And I was thinking to myself, wow, if this isn't a sign of the ephemeral, like taking over my life right now, I don't know what is. So, you know, I've got my eyes right on that beautiful rainbow. And within a second, it was gone, just like that. And when we have rainbows in, in Brooklyn, <laughs> and we do have them there, um, when we have rainbows, they fade, you know, they, they, they fade to nothing. This one was gone like boom, just like a, it just went away. And <laughs> it, was just, it, it was just a really beautiful experience and I wanna thank all of you for bringing me here to have some of these just supercharged wonderful experiences. And I especially want to thank uh, the folklore faculty and Lisa Gabbard for bringing me. Lisa has been wonderful to work with. She's smoothed the road for me to, to, to come here today. And of course, um, uh, I want to thank Austin and Alta Fife for, you know, for having the foresight to, you know, create an amazing collection of folklore here in Utah and also to be um, you know the, the the sort of forebearers of this of this lecture series it's very important for folklorists to you know have a soapbox to really you know sort of present their current thinking um, and you know this is a wonderful opportunity for me it gave me uh, uh, an amazing amount of um, of time over the past you know six weeks or so to really rethink some things that I've been thinking about for a long time and sort of try to push them a little bit so that's what uh, that's what you're gonna get today we'll see if it works out um, and uh, yeah I wanted also to um, I wanted to dedicate my talk today to Barry Tolkien, um, the plenitude of whose influence I think we all feel, and um, it's, it's very important for me to recognize uh, his work here um, and to give this to him and also to dedicate this talk to my rainbow yesterday, and I think that Barry would totally understand why I could dedicate my talk to him and to a rainbow. I want to begin today with a quote from the Romanian philosopher uh, E.M. Chorin. This is from a book that he did called Tears and Saints in 1995. He also is the writer of a very, very interesting book that I recommend to you called A Short History of Decay, published in 1950. I can't forgive the saints for having undertaken their great feats without first tasting the plenitude of the ephemeral. And I will not forgive them for not having shed a single tear of gratitude for things that pass. Every time I feel a passionate longing for the earth, for all that is born and dies, every time I hear the call of the ephemeral, I must protect God from my hatred. I spare him 
out of immemorial cowardice. Yet I think of the revenge of transitory things, and I fear for his safety. Well, perhaps you're glad I didn't call my talk the revenge of transitory things, but I might have. If you, if you live long enough enjoying the benefits of being a folklorist, you may arrive at a moment, as I have recently, of being extremely thankful for your obsessions with the folk and the lore in whatever form you've chosen, or better yet, whatever form has chosen you. For me, it has been home altars and fairy tales, witches, goddesses, and madonnas, women's folklore, and numerous side roads taken and rabbit holes dived into all along the way. Folklore generously provides us with big questions and big problems concerning people and art and communication and feeling. Some bits of folklore can get under the skin of your brain, provoking, irritating, asking, always a circling back, a desire to finish something that perhaps can never be finished, to answer a question that maybe cannot be answered, for me to answer the call of the ephemeral. I was a graduate student in folklore at the University of Texas during the height of the performance school of folklore. Richard Bauman's verbal artist performance and Delheim's breakthrough into performance had only recently been published. The so-called Young Turks at UT were pushing our discipline into the future. Many of their ideas were captured in books such as New Directions in Folklore and also the Ethnography of Speaking. The department's scholarly lineage included famous names who were studying vernacular performance in other disciplines. Irving Goffman in sociology, Victor Turner in anthropology, and Richard Schechner in theater. Schechner was just getting underway with what eventually became the Performance Studies Department at NYU, where I have been an adjunct since 2002. The Performance School of Folklore faded from prominence, and for all intents and purposes, the UT Austin program ended in the mid-1980s. Performance studies, on the other hand, grew at NYU, expanded as a discipline, and now offers masters and PhD programs throughout the world. Why the summary? Because at the heart of the talk I'm about to give, I appeal to a reigniting of performance theory as an important school of thought, still relevant, even necessary, to the continuing success of folklore studies. Just a little itch I'm still scratching. Against the background of academic ideologies that privilege the permanent, the determinate, the solid, the late performance studies scholar Jose Munoz asserted that inquiry into ephemeral performances offers an antidote, a rethinking of what may usefully constitute access to cultural and social meaning. Especially in hidden queer acts, hidden as a result of homophobia, he challenged us to read the hint, the trace, the innuendo as valuable ephemeral resources, in place of hard evidence, rigor, and the rigor mortis of ideas that results from it. He encouraged an uplifting of the transitory, a recognition that culture persists as much through letting go as through holding on, holding dear. For folklorists, this means something quite refreshing, I think, to recognize more fully that embedded in what makes the sense of tradition valuable to our understanding of folklore is the sensational transitory. The fast, the cheap, and yes, the out of control, out of our control. Due to their volatility, ephemeral processes are not necessarily rule-bound. You can't control a ghost except by denying it, and you can't manage the flame of a candle except by putting it out. But to really get the benefit of a ghost or a candle, you have to submit to its evanescence. You have to read its message by letting go. Like cool water slipping through your hands, you have to flow with the materiality, as it presents itself. My focus today is on a particular mode of performance, observed, enacted, and felt across the genres we study. The ephemeral is, import, is an important concept for understanding the full measure of agencies released and made effective in certain of the social and cultural acts that we call folklore. Ephemerality refers us to behaviors, mentalities, activities, and things which are short-lived. Ephemerality directs our attention toward the fleeting, 
the fragile, the expendable, and the exhaustible. The word ephemeral defines that which begins and ends in a day. And the lowly mayfly is its standard exhibit in nature because a mayfly is born in the morning, flies up into the afternoon sun, has lunch, descends, dies by dinner. The ephemeral refers to that which lasts for a day. The life and death of a day underscores a particular sense of temporality that invites our exploration of folklore performances especially marked by their transience, yet thereby heightened in their intensity of feeling and expression. I'll refer today primarily to my work on women's domestic altars and vernacular memorials, briefly mentioning other areas of interest as well, hauntings and hauntology and fairy tale states such as enchantment. But you could add to these, I'm certain, and I hope you will. I'll admit, just as a point of rhetoric, the oddity of a folklorist's interest in the ephemeral. Folklore's central concern has generally been with what stays, not with what goes, with what remains, not with what disappears, with what cyclically repeats, not with the singular hot instance. We lean to the traditional, not the ephemeral. But this binary is no doubt overstated. I write the slash to unwrite it. And to demonstrate the significant degree to which expressive folklore codifies, never solidifies, the ephemeral. In fact, many of our colleagues have investigated ephemeral phenomena. Among them, Susan, Suzanne K. Seraph has explored the annual Mexican Days of the Dead, specifically in terms of traditional ephemeral objects such as sugar skulls, chrysanthemums, and food, offerings that enliven this liminal time of access between the living and the dead. Jack Santino, Peggy Yoakum, Steve Zeitlin, among others, immediately grasped what Jack called the performative co commemorative aspect of the ephemeral memorials that came up after September 11th. Deborah Caption's study of women's henna practices in Morocco works the ephemeral permanence binary to good effect, I think. Whereas Moroccan women are permanently tattooed for purposes of adornment or protection, impermanent henna paintings on the skin's surface mark status change and transition, most importantly from unmarried to married status. Caption notes that more Caption notes more than the permanent ephemeral binary between tattoo and henna, she works to unlock the meaning of ephemeral processes, referring to henna as a plastic art, notable for its malleability, its ability to perform change. Quote, its very transience lends it much of its potency. As it must always be reapplied, henna art potentially expresses a multiplicity of meanings and forms, one of which is the renewal of the feminine community itself. Unquote. Further, Caption suggests that henna's ephemeral and revisible nature make it a more able carrier of multiple symbols than the indelible tattoo. Caption attests to the potential for a rich folkloristics of the ephemeral, one that opens a door to an important discourse concerning temporality, how the meaning of time plays out in the meaning of folklore. The traditional and the ephemeral conjoin in our human struggle to live with those so-called ravages of time. Let me give an example known to all of you and studied by many of us. Libby Tucker, Diane Goldstein, and of course USU's own Jeannie Thomas, as well as by performance studies scholars such as Munoz and the queer theorist Beth Freeman. The comings and goings of ghosts in stories, legends, and in visual and auditory experience underscore the thin veil separating the short time of life from the long duration of death. Ghosts are popularly viewed as otherworldly, but like Avery Gordon concludes in her book Ghostly Matters, and Folklore Studies anticipates, I think, even before her, ghosts are in fact social figures, and haunting is a constituent element of social life. Ghosts are dead performers whose presence stands for an absence. Ghosts mark loss, incompletion, regret all pointing to that problem stated so well in Shakespeare's Hamlet, the time being out of joint. That they appear and disappear, come and go, assuming what Gordon calls their seething presence in an ethereal and ephemeral form proves the unsettled nature of their absence. They are in limbo, in a between space and a between time that must be reckoned. 
Their transitory behaviors are their means of communicating. To paraphrase Jacques Derrida from his Spectres of Marx, our aim should be not to exorcise, thereby chasing ghosts away, but rather to draw closer to them, to grant them the right to a hospitable memory out of a concern for justice. In another arena familiar to folklorists, fairy tales provide recourse to the realm of enchantment, that special time-altered place reserved for transformative experiences and experiments. If the realm is short-lived and feels like a dreamscape, it nonetheless offers an alternative sensation of heightened vitality to those protagonists who are deliberately ejected from the real by, say, falling down a well into an underground, bright, sunny meadow, as what happens in the story in Grimm's called Frau Hola. Fairy tales may hurtle headlong toward normative reunion, marriage, and social stability, but the route they navigate detours into untimed, topsy-turvy spaces filled with marvels, magic, and weird meetups. These don't simply contradict the normal, but rather they constitute a transient and a transitional zone for fulfilling alternative desires that can affect individual destinies. Crucially, the move into an enchanted realm stops the story's progress. It is the site of a rousing, decisive difference for the protagonist. But it can't last. Lessons must be learned, feelings must be awakened, Destiny shaped in the blink of a fairy tale eye, or better, the wave of a fairy tale wand. That wave, momentary and trailed with the ephemera of glittering stardust, leaves nothing but a trace. But what a trace it is, the trace of a better future. Jack Zipes' sociocultural approach to temporality in German romantic tales suggests they were written in an era when time was increasingly rationalized as a tool of efficient modes of production. Most of these tales, he says, quote, involve an uplifting of time. They dissolve normal sequential patterns. Time becomes timeless so that the protagonist can create his or her own time. Fairy tales create a wonder-filled and inviting standard for appreciating flashes of enchantment defined by Jane Bennett as that feeling of being connected in an affirmative way to existence. It is to be under the momentary impression that the natural and cultural worlds offer gifts and in so doing remind us that it is good to be alive." Unquote. Henna, hauntings, enchantment, and so many more examples to add. I'll just quickly mention the Navajo string figures brought to attention by Barry Tolkien. Um, with these, the vast cosmos of Spider Woman is illustrated with bits of twine, an easily accessed femoral, ephemeral resource easily disposed of when the story ends. And I'd also like to bring to mind Kathy Preston's wonderful work, work on paper ephemera, because she took, you know, very, um, she, she took very cast aside uh, pieces of paper like broadsides and doodles and things of that nature that had been uh, considered only evidence of quote unquote low culture. And she took those pieces of paper and raised them up to show that they were really uh, a kind of cultural literacy of the poor and the disenfranchised. Very important work there. And I also want to note um, the work of a local Provo artist whose name is Brian Hutchison. I met Brian um, when he was getting his master's uh, in studio art at the Pratt uh, Institute in, in Brooklyn. And um, uh, Brian is back here in, in Utah and uh, he does amazing work. He's a beautiful artist, a beautiful carpenter, and a beautiful printmaker. And he works on issues of ephemerality in, um, in Mormon legend. Um, he worked uh, to create um, a model of a legendary mine outside of Salem, Utah, that is called the Relief Mine or the Dream Mine. It it was, and his family um, was related to the bishop who, in the late 19th century, um, 
got a number of believers around him. Uh, it was during a, a millenarian period in uh, the LDS church when uh, you know the end times were coming. And uh, Bishop Coyle said, well, there's this mine, and it's the giving mine that's going to give gold and food and all the things that we're going to need to start up again, you know, and so uh, so Brian was very in touch with the idea that these ephemeral resources, these imagined resources of the of of the mine, that they could keep on being given through the legend. That you know, it didn't matter whether it ever happened. It was the story that was important, the story that represented the potential for ephemeral things to become real. So I suggest that you go to his website. He's a wonderful artist, and he lives right down the road here. Um, okay. For me, working to unlock the meaning of vernacular ephemeral processes has been an endeavor carried out primarily in my work on altars and memorials. The home altar in Mexican culture is a personal space of devotion where a kind of folk Catholicism is practiced and handed down generally through the female line from mother to daughter. Personal family and religious histories enjoy a temporal collapse into each other at this microcosmic site. And this, uh, I'm going to turn to some photographs, but you're welcome to gaze upon Chole Piscina up there with her altar. Um, among many aspects of Mexican-American women's home altars I've studied over the years, I became interested in the way certain brief expenditures were made daily by altaristas, women who keep altars, to create pathways to relationship with the divine. A candle lighted, incense burned, holy water sprinkled, gestures made, the sign of the cross on the body, sighs ex ex exhaled, and prayers said into the night. These momentary acts performed a ritual exchange of invisible relational energies. I light this candle, the transient flame of which proclaims my faith in you. Or I make the sign of the cross over my body to signify in this fleeting gesture my allegiance to you and my recognition of your suffering. The altar table, laden with personal saints, statues, flowers, prayer cards, photos, votive candles, and idiosyncratic personal items such as stuffed animals, stones, and bits of cloth, composes a gestural theater integrating ephemerality and performativity. Now that's a lot of ality and tivity. More simply, what I mean here is that the altar is an assemblage of vital materials, many of them ephemeral in nature and wedded to ephemeral gestures and speech. Together, they perform a woman's desire for relationship with the divine and they are performative in making that relationship happen. The home altar, ancient in its legacy as a site for recognizing the potentiating power of the sublime ephemeral, energizing the threshold and closing the gap between human and divine, earth and heaven, vacating the here and now for the then and there. The altar is laid out like a workspace where women negotiate their needs and desires with God through the saints and especially through the Virgin Mary in her Mexican representations as Our Lady of Guadalupe and La Virgen de San Juan, de los Lagos, and many others. Because altar keeping at home is a daily practice, almost all the activities taking place there are ephemeral by definition. They are of the day and will be repeated tomorrow. Folk Catholic personal altars share in a broader tradition across cultures and religions. Hinduism, Buddhism, Paganism, Santeria, Candomblé, of altars, yard shrines, pilgrimage shrines, grottos, roadside shrines, all human-made markers indicating the intersection of human and divine interests. Often these interests focus on the great pain and mystery of death. Memorial altars, grave sites, ancestral altars, such as Mex Mexican Days of the Dead ofrendas, all serve as points of contact created by the living to meet the dead in memory and through the act of remembrance. In the past 30 years, secular extensions of these old culturally embedded traditions have emerged in the rise of spontaneous memorials, what the press also calls makeshift memorials, what Jack Santino better uh, named commemorative performatives, uh, performatives, and what I have called ephemeral memorials. By any other name, a sea change in folk expression that resituates the visual style and ephemeral materials of altars and shrines for a new use. 
Different from the altar's role in relational performances with the divine, ephemeral memorials recognize relationship to the traumatically displaced, disappeared, or murdered. But they are related in kind and purpose, in a highly effective crossover of similar ingredients, candles, flowers, food, images, paper, ephemera, such as cards and notes, mementos. The sacred is made to serve the secular. Think of John Lennon in 1980, the outside of the Dakota Hotel covered with pictures, flowers, and farewells. Think the same of Princess Diana and all of those flowers heaped up in front of Buckingham Palace. Of AIDS memorials in the 80s, of Columbine and Texas A&M memorials. And then the massive array of September 11th memorials that quickly arose, seemingly spontaneous in their appearance, all over New York City parks and squares beginning on September 12th of 2001 and lasting through pain and rain until early October when the city, after numerous failed attempts, finally cleared out the accumulation. In a 2009 essay for Western folklore, I wrote about September 11th memorials and what I called the burden of the ephemeral. I don't want to repeat too much from an essay you could grab off of JSTOR or even read in the library if you like, but I want to return briefly to that work to invite once again, and I hope to enhance a little bit, my call in that essay to classify modes of ephemerality, following to a certain extent, riffing off of Roger Abrams' um, classic uh, essay, Complex Relations of Simple Forms, published in Dan Benamos's Folklore Genres in 1976. I propose a complex relations of simple ephemeral forms. But maybe I'm just exercising my rights as a folklorist to categorize? What is it with folklore and classification systems? Tale types, song types, house types, you gotta love us. We have nailed the beauty of form and variation like no one ever has, and we should be famous, but I digress. <laughs> Looking across different sites, Altars, memorials, shrines, and graves, ephemeral resources and process, processes are called upon in specific ways to address temporal concerns, to help fill in the big gaps of human life on planet Earth between sacred and mundane, grief and mourning, the living and the dead. Certainly one outcome of a typology might be a more definitive appraisal of the various communicative strategies of symbolic objects we tend to take for granted, things such as flowers and candles and photos. In different domains of use and in different cultures, they do different work. Their exact materiality both limits and expands their symbolic utility. Take flowers as an easy example. Flowers on a home altar are offerings that indicate honor and respect for deities and saints. They acknowledge the temporal distinction between the human and divine and a desire to overcome this through verbal communication or prayer. They also serve as tokens of exchange. Roses presented to Guadalupe ensure that her goodwill will be given back to the giver. As spontaneous offerings to the dead, flowers on September 11th memorials at Union Square marked the fleetingness of human life, and they also blanketed social wounds with natural beauty. Flowers, as we folklorists know, are old in their use to indicate the cyclical, the ever-returning after the dying. And in New York, they did so in the face of profound linear anxiety, not knowing what the future would hold at all. Flowers on a grave are brought in remembrance, feelings and memories shared in the shape and color of blooms and petals. Inside an almost 200-year-old private Mexican cemetery in San Antonio, Texas, flowers are still placed on the graves of family members who died in the 19th century. As one woman said to me, quote, she was our tia then, she is our tia now. Tia means aunt in Spanish. In their fullness of bloom, flower offerings replenish relationship. At the same time, the latent sense of their decay imposes the reality of unrecoverable loss. Other resources to be named in our typology include candles, incense, food, and their composition of wax, wick, copal, fruit, and grain, their transformation into light, smoke, taste, aroma. I could go on. They all share dynamic properties of volatility, expenditure, and decay. They all work together in collaboration with visual images to jump the gap. 
These resources are complemented by ephemeral processes, modes of expression such as gesture, speaking, repetition, and fragmentation. Altogether, they create what Desartes, writing in a different context, calls, quote, a space of enunciation, unquote, a dynamic, discursive site for invoking the relational. As I did with flowers, let me give an example of modes of um, modes of, uh, of, pro of ephemeral process. The gesture, a manner of nonverbal communication using the body itself to voice desires and meanings. Short-lived bodily performances in motion, lost except in their immediate enactment. Gestures may be linked to speech, but they are independent performatives deriving much of their communicative potency by not requiring language at all to verify. Gestures may be conventional, as in folding hands to in index prayer or winking to express conviviality. Others are of a highly personal nature. We are endeared to our intimates by recognition of their habitual performance of idiosyncratic gestures. Origins of the word gesture embed the Middle English and Medieval Latin gestura, a mode of action equivalent to the Latin word gest, from gerere, to bear, behave, or perform. Gesture is also linked to jest, a story, a romance in verse or prose, a deed, an exploit. The etymology is suggestive of the story told by the body as it gestures. The performative effectiveness of altars and memorials is owed in large part to gesture. Momentary gestures are linked to ephemeral materiality. Flowers must be placed, candles must be ignited, photos must be kissed and centrally set. The sign of the cross must be made. The phrase, a gesture of sympathy, comes to mind. Grieving gestures performed at the memorials sympathetically connect the living and the dead. Gestures are embodied performances of attachment. One gestures to be recognized by another. And I think some of the things that I've just been talking about will come alive a little bit more and I, as I turn to a few, a few uh, pictures for you. Um, so, yeah, I, as I said earlier, this is Doña Chole Piscina. Um, she was my great teacher about um, women's home altars uh, in Austin, Texas. And she had a beautiful altar. Um, go ahead, Lisa, we'll take the next one. You can see it a little bit better. Beautiful altar laid out like a table. Um, and Chole always said that she went here to do her work, you know, her negocio. And, and what that meant to a certain extent, and what I'm trying to get at here today, is that by doing work, what she meant to a certain extent was that she manipulated all of these things, right? She manipulated, you can take the next slide, um, especially these candles that she lit and posted by photos of people that she was praying for. She was a very active petitioner and she was someone who many people came to to, uh, to seek various kinds of, of healing requests, especially from um, her greatest ally who was Saint Anthony, San Antonio, who is uh, the finder of lost things. So people would come to her with requests and then she would burn these candles and, you know, Chola, you can't see this. Um, I have a picture of it, but I couldn't find it. But underneath her altar, it was just stacked with burned down votive candles. Just like, you know, just piled in there. Um, and, uh, uh, okay, let's take the next one. Yeah, so this picture it is, is on the right-hand side of Chole's altar. I wanted to show it to you because it's always moved me so much. It shows in such a, a very simple and beautiful way that collapse of the secular world, the sacred world, and the familial world. So th there's a card, um, a funeral card for, for uh, JFK. Next to that photo on the right is uh, Chole's cousin who she was, um, had, who had, was deceased at the time that I knew her, but who she had, had prayed for many times. And then that's a, a picture of the Virgin of the Rosary. But the thing that I just love about this picture as I've been rethinking some of this stuff uh, over the past number of weeks and re-looking is the way that tape, you know, that tape is just, it's peeling and curling up, but it's still holding, you know, it's still holding that world, you know, together, those three worlds that are together in that picture. Okay, Lisa. Okay, now right down the street from Chole, so all these women that I first met for my dissertation research, they all lived on the same block, um, 7th Street in Austin. 
East 7th Street in Austin, Texas. And this was the altar of a woman named Micaela Zapata. Now, I have so many stories to tell you about her, but the one that is most relevant for our discussion today is that she was dedicated to um, the Nino Jesus, the baby Jesus. So she always had Christmas, you know, it was Christmas 365 days out of the year at her altar, as you can see from the little um, tablecloth there with the poinsettias on it, and there are poinsettias on her altar. But the, th the thing that, that really was so interesting about her was that she had a, a whole aesthetic sense of the ephemerality of light and glitter. That those, you had to have light and glitter on your altar. And she said to me one day, uh, just such a classic, you know, she, she said, glitter was made by God for the folk. And it was so resonant in the sense of that she, she thought that glitter, an, an aesthetic move, you know, by God to give the folk something cheap and shiny and out of control, right, <laughs> that they could use, that the folk could use to show their relationship back to, you know, back to God and the saints. Glitter was made by God for the folk. I want you to remember that if you remember nothing else from this lecture today. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, so here, Petra Castorena, a woman uh, in uh, Laredo, Texas, who um, was a very, very dear woman. You can see in the sort of center left a picture of a young man. Uh, her son had gone missing. And at the time that I met Petra, her son had been disappeared for like um, over two years. But she prayed to Guadalupe every day and to please her and to make sure that she knew that her requests were, you know, very serious, Petra Castorena put fresh flowers on the altar every day, banked it with fresh flowers every day. So in terms of what I was saying earlier about the way these flowers, you know, these ephemeral, you know, flowers, they, they constitute a, a, a really... Um, important for Petra, for Petra Castorena, an important message to Guadalupe that, you know, you've, you know, I adore you and I want you to give me back my adored son. Um, unfortunately, as far as I know, the son never returned. Um, Gloria Rocha is next. Gloria Rocha, great woman, dedicated to La Virgen de San Juan de los Lagos, now in South Texas and North Mexico, she is more important than Guadalupe. She is who you petition and pray to for a new house, for a safe birth, for all the kinds of things that women are really concerned about. Um, uh, but the thing that I wanted to point out to you is that what women do is they cut their own hair and put it on the statue. Um, so that's Gloria's hair from when she was, um, when she was married. Um, she cut her hair and she saved her hair and on a regular, uh, you know, annual or every, you know, on the feast day of, of uh, San Juan, she takes little bits of that hair and also her daughter's hair and puts it on the statue. So again, a, an ephemeral resource, you know, the iconicity, so another thing that could come into this typology might be something about iconicity, like being like, and that there's, there can be ephemeral, you know, resources that one might use to establish the likeness between the human and the divine, um, and also the kind of relational desire. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh yeah, now this is a woman uh, also in Laredo, Mrs. Saldana. Um, the, the reason I wanted to show you this one uh, is that this is a woman who had a problem with her husband. Her husband did not like her to have her home altar. He thought it was junky and he wanted, he constantly wanted her to get rid of it. And she, you know, wound up saying to me, I'll never get rid of it. He's high, higher than a kite. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and so when she, so when she showed me this, she said to me, this is my real altar. This is the real deal. Because she had other things in her house that were more formal, like a picture of Guadalupe with little fake flowers around it and stuff like that. But when she brought me back into, this is a little niche near the laundry room where she, and she had, there's a little chair there. And it's just, it's just a hodgepodge of ephemera. You know, it's, you know, it's Mother's Day cards, it's candles, it's, you know, that's a picture of her father with his pipe in front of it. Um, 
you know, you can tell in the marriage that that probably didn't go over too well, that dad was being worshipped on the little <laughs> altar. But, um, <laughs> but um, in those jars up on the upper left there, those are the buttons when her children, as her children grew, she made clothes for her kids, and as her children grew out of the clothes, she clipped the buttons off and saved them as little mementos of her, of her children's growing up. So, you know, it's just in some ways, you know, I love this because it's made really on some level of nothing but ephemeral stuff, stuff that's really pretty, you know, pretty disposable, um, but for her, Repre represents the place where the real, you know, the real stuff can get done, and she says her daily prayers there. Okay. Next. Oh well, this. Okay, so then I wanted to show you how glitter was made by God for the folk. So, so uh, this is from a, a family. Um, in San Antonio, who uh, were dedicated to a folk saint named Nino Fidencio, very interesting uh, cult um, from northern Mexico, has its own, you know, sort of world of material goods. And Cuca um, Borrego and her daughter uh, Cynthia made these beautiful, flashy, sparkly altars, uh, I mean, crosses, because they wanted their, um, you know, they wanted. Um, uh, Nino, they did it to give Nino a gift of beauty. Okay? It's beautiful crosses. Okay? Oh, and this is, th this woman, uh, her name is Donia. She never revealed what her true name is. She, she operated a little business in, um, uh, in Juarez, on the other side of El Paso, in Mexico. And you see on her altar are these jars of water, and people would come to her who wanted to cross the uh, the river, the Rio Grande, and she would do a divination inside the water jar to see if it was safe or not for them to cross, whether it was a good idea for them to cross. So again, you know, using this kind of very ephemeral resource, you know, um, and, and, and it being tied to a very critical, you know, aspect of someone's life, whether or not they could actually, you know, cross the border um, into Texas. Okay. Yeah, now I wanted to turn just very briefly to the work of uh, um, a young gay um, artist whose name is Rudy Maron. He's from Kansas City. Um, and Rudy grew up with altars, uh, traditional Mexican altars that uh, his, his mother uh, kept. But as a young gay man living in Kansas City, he began a process of using the altar as a way to, to mark um, his, what he considered to be a marginal status. So what he did in this piece that's called Mishwakanex is that he took all the elements of the altar and he put them out on the wall so you had to look at them as as separate items. And this I found to be very, very interesting because my whole thesis, and you're gonna, we're gonna get there really soon, my whole thesis depends on an idea that this stuff has to be together. It has to be assembled, right? And Rudy was kind of saying, you know what? The way I feel about it all, these things are just, they're just items. They're just and they don't necessarily connect. So it was, it, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, go, go to the next one, though. But then he did this thing called souvenirs, in which he created an altar to his first relationship, his first successful relationship with a boyfriend. And he created this beautiful ephemeral altar that, and go to the next one, you get a, a little bit of a close-up of it. You know, all made from, and that's his boyfriend there, slightly obscured, but he used all of these kind of plastic and tape and different kinds of stuff that, netting and tree branches and, you know, little butterflies that he got at the 99 cent store to create this scene, uh, this lovely kind of scene of his relationship. So the two, you know, the two are very distinctly different in their, in their intent. Um, uh, and this piece uh, I, I found to be very, very beautiful. Um, okay, 
then I wanted to give you just a little bit of a sense of what September 11th uh, memorials looked like uh, in Union Square. People did do really um, amazing things like create images of the Twin Towers out of, you know, tin foil and, you know, cardboard and that kind of thing. There were amazing things like that that were done. But you can see the, you know, the degree to which, um, you know, that, that assemblage and pushing together of the material is, is really, really happening in this, in this photograph. Go to the next one. And as well here, this gives you a better sense if you, if you look uh, out into that photograph to where it's going behind, it's going out into Union Square and the entire square is just covered like this for, you know, for the uh, entire like two or three blocks that front uh, 14th Street. So um, that kind of recognition of and, and that way that people knew, the thing that interested me was the, the way that people knew to go to you know, their 99 cent store or their bodega or their grocery store and grab a candle and get some flowers on the, you know, and grab a flag you know, or, or whatever. They just went and grabbed all this stuff up. And they, you know, that, that, that transfer had been made from the sacred to the secular in a really, in a really interesting way, and people were able to do it on their own um, without instruction, right? Okay, so. All of this having been said, my, my last little bit here for you is, um, is a little, is kind of where I'm working on this material now. And I call this portion of the talk, I'm a thing, you're a thing. Way back at the beginning of this talk, I praised the performance school. Now I'm going to bury it, but just a little. For as many of you will recall, that school was centered in verbal arts and linguistics. Everyone was in love with language in that period, from Levi Strauss to Derrida and La Di Da. That period gave us the now well-worn language trope. Even things that weren't about language now became texts. We could read objects, interpret them. I was very happy with this kind of analysis, and really, in large part, I still am. But I think there's room for another view. Having contemplated both the sublime and the burdened ephemeral for lo these many years, I turn the wheel of my interest one more round, let it be the last. In my own examples, I think I cut short the operative value of the ephemeral in favor of the interpretive. By the operative, I refer to the purely materialist aspect of the altar or, mem or memorial as an assemblage, a special assemblage of things. What is the material intelligence of a votive candle, a photograph of a beloved child, a saint's image, a fresh rose, each in their own assignment working to bridge the gap between human and divine, or between the real and symbolic. On this strictly materialist plane, I originally maintained years ago that communications at a home altar benefited from material accumulation, the compounding effect of one thing enhancing the performance of another, a votive candle lighted next to the photo of a deceased family member, a fresh vase of roses beneath the image of Guadalupe. Repetition too and layering constitute acts of aesthetic agency. My teacher Soledad Chole Pesina explained that having more images of beloved saints was better. A repetition of Guadalupe's image, statues, pictures, votives, increased acknowledgement of her power and showed one's devoted allegiance. Proliferation also yielded more available power for a multitude of needs. As Senora Chela Gonzalez apostrophized, quote, many Guadalupes, but only one San Ramon. Drawing on the nascent feminist art history of that time, I suggested that women's home altars exhibited the properties of thamage, what artist Miriam Shapiro uh, did to rethink collage and assemblage. In quilting, cooking, altar making, and other domestic arts, women created something out of nothing, taking the bits and pieces of their material domestic world and putting them together to nourish body, soul, and mind. They used ephemeral means to reach substantial ends. They were deeply materialist in their spiritual goals. They were mothers. Maternity, materiality, and eternity combined in them.
Michaela Zapata, the woman who talked about glitter being given by God, also said to me at one point in her altar room, I close myself off with my santos y cosas, my saints and things. And I went back to look at that and I thought, yeah, now I get it. I get it, you know. While I think I explained the process, I feel I never understood completely how it worked and why it worked. From a human-centered view, I saw things on the altar as symbolic objects activated by a woman's directive, especially her prayers. Yet some dis dissatisfaction persisted. Not that I was wrong, but that I wasn't finished. Never finished. Recent discussions, however, in the philosophy of science helped to rescue me, if not fully, from going to the grave with certain questions unanswered. Now, as an end note, I turn to the work of the political theorist Jane Bennett, whose 2010 book, Vibrant Matter, brings forceful philosophic recognition to the vitality and volatility of things. If such recognition is already affirmed in folklore forms and folklore study, as I think it is, let's see what science has to say to us and us to science. Bennett looks at the inherent vitality of a wide range of things from earthworms to electric power grids. Such vitality, she says, is not a cultural or social interpretation, not, quote, a function of the intersubjective connotations, memories, and affects that accumulate around our ideas about objects. Rather, she comes to see objects as what she calls actants. And in this sense, she views all things, human bodies, garbage, minerals, quote, as lively and self-organizing rather than passive or mechanical means under the direction of something non-material that is an active soul or mind, unquote. Bennett takes man's so-called dominion over the earth and smashes it to smithereens, to the smithereens of its constituent lively parts that have no use of man. If we have use of them, it is through partnership that we will succeed in joining forces. Bennett's project counters the creed of human exceptionalism with a new credo of vital materialism that may include but is not subject to human trajectories. Something, not all of this radical idea is embedded in the folklore that improves, that approves and improves the useful power of transitory things. Specifically, in terms of my unsolved altar issues, Bennett's chapter called The Agency of Assemblages was very intriguing to me. She complements what she calls thing power with associative power, something that I felt that I'd been doing for quite some time. Much as I have shown you today about altar items, things come into full potential through interaction with other things. The efficacy or agency of anything always depends on collaboration, cooperation, or interactive interference of many bodies and forces, says Bennett. She captures the workings of this kind of agency in what she calls distributive agency, the way power is shared across networks of vital, thingly resourcefulness. Quote, what is at work here is what she calls an assemblage, defined by her as an ad hoc group of diverse elements of vibrant materials of all sorts. Assemblages are living, throbbing confederations of the human and non-human. And this is what she then concludes, there was never a time when human agency was anything other than an interfolding network of humanity and non-humanity. This is a key idea, but in a sense for folklore, perhaps it's nothing new. I always wondered why the altar or memorial assemblage was so consistent across time and space, across the very long durée. The look and character and use of a Catholic home altar recorded in a 15th century Italian painting is not alien to, in fact, is recognizably similar to Chole's or Cello's and also to yours or mine and similar, in fact, to September 11th memorials. Again, Bennett is suggestive in saying that, as in the traditional Chinese concept of Xi, the agency of assemblages refers to potential that originates, quote, not in human initiatives, but instead results from the very disposition of things. The very disposition of things. Xi is the style 
energy, propensity, trajectory, or elan inherent to a specific arrangement of things, the dynamic force emanating from a spatio-temporal configuration rather than from any particular element in it, unquote. The disposition of things composing a home altar, or even the more recent spontaneous memorial, are geared toward transformational, interactive, energy-releasing, ephemeral performances that give these sites their very reason for being. Over generations in use, the juxtaposition of these things has been refined. A kind of self-organizing principle comes into play, evincing a formulaic beauty. A woman collaborates with her things, and her things collaborate with her. And that's what I think Mikhail Zapata was saying, I close myself off with my saints and my things. That's what you see, too, in the spontaneous creation of, of today's memorials. It's not spontaneity in the sense of out of nowhere. It's spontaneity in the sense of a realized collaboration, if unconscious, between humans and non-human elements. Both have a sense of style. Tradition owes a debt to thingliness, and thingliness owes a debt to tradition. Did I get it right? I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to talk further about it over the next few days, and I look forward to that. I do thank you, though, for indulging me in this kind of experimental thinking about the importance of folklore. All told, what I've tried to do here today is restore, perhaps revivify, old connections we have with performance, performativity, and material culture as materialist culture. Or has this talk amounted to little more than an invitation to a reunion with the old functional view of folklore? As Barry Tolkien expressed it, saying, quote, still, another scholarly preference is leaning toward the explanation of how and why certain kinds of folklore continue to operate in any given instance. This orientation may be termed the functional approach. Why do certain elements of folklore come into being? Why do we continue to pass them on? Those questions remain of interest, increasing interest, in a world that seems more and more to be described by the common definition of ephemeral, lasting only for a day. Thank you. Anything you like. What do you think about that non-human human thing? That's what I want to know. I leaned over to um, Lynn and I'm like, I wish Amelia were here. So one yes. of our graduate students yes. studied that. That's part oh. of her thesis. Oh, that's part of her thesis? Yes. Oh. She wrote about objects with agency objects. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh, I, I'd like to be in contact with her. Yeah. She I think it's a really interesting way to go. Yeah. Really. Well, I think it goes. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say. I think it goes to, um, you know, what people have, non-scholars have talked about all along, which is there is a power inherent in the cross. Yeah. There's power inherent in this picture. Right. Right. Whatever object it is. I mean, yes, that's, that's right. For a long time. That's right. The scholars haven't necessarily taken that at face value. Yes, I think that's true. I think that's exactly true. Yeah. I found my, I wrote down about halfway through and then I sort of felt like, like I got it right. I was really excited. I, I, one of my notes was, is the weight of the ephemeral in aggregation or accumulation? Right. Is, is that where something, and, and I wasn't even thinking in, in terms of, of the things, I was thinking more in terms of the, the, the lighting of a candle or the speaking of a prayer, the things that are truly gone. Right. Moment they're over, right. is the weight of those things only in the accumulated weight of, I do this every day, I do this every however so often, or is that, I mean, and, and then I found myself thinking maybe that's just what makes it recognizable to us, maybe that's what makes it folklore, re re repetition. Yeah, yeah, the repetition. That it happens, you know, again and again, is there, I sort of felt that what you were getting at maybe was that in, be, because of that relationship between the things, even outside of the aggregation of the action, even outside right. of every single day I do this, just in that moment, the things sort of provide that weight 
They, but for that singular action. That's right. That's exactly right. That, I think my big aha moment in all of this was simply that, oh, all of those things are there for these ephemeral performances to take place. Mm -hmm. You know, so over time, this, I, I, you know, I, I had been really interested in why, why these, th this particular thing just stayed the same, the same look, the same character, the same placement of things over such a long period of time. But, you know, I think I, what I've tried to do is get a little bit closer to the idea that the things themselves, because they self-organize, you know, and the performances that take place in relationship to them, you know, the, the, there's a give and take there of some kind that then tradition operates to, you know, sort of carry it along, you know. That's, that's the part that we know very well, that it gets passed along, and that a woman, you know, in, you know, a, a lot of these women would have received, for example, their first statue of Guadalupe on their wedding day, and their mother would have said, now you make an altar at your house, you know, at, at your new house. But, you know, they would then have gone and done that same thing, which would have been place the statue in the middle, place the candles in front, place the foot, you know, all that. And, and it was that kind of thing where I was like, but, yeah, and, and then that happened on September 11th in the exact same way, you know, that people just ran out and grabbed all that stuff. And, and it had been happening. I mean, there, there was precedent um, for what happened on September 11th. It's just that September 11th kind of represented, a, you know, the tipping point of it all, where it just kind of tipped into this incredible, you know, sort of um, expressive... Um, you know, uh, unconscious expressive frenzy that everybody sort of did the same thing and went the same way all at once and created this proliferation. Um, and, and that was where that whole idea, too, I think, of proliferation, what people wanted to do was do, and that's, that kind of happened with Princess Di. They just wanted more and more flowers, more, you know, thousands of bouquets of flowers, you know. You know so, so it's that, like, what is that, you know, why, you know, one is not enough, a million is, is not enough, you know, what, you know, but it has to do with that layering, that, you know, that pushing, you know, pushing the materiality into, you know, into the, you know, into the, 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 the sort of affect zone, right? The place where you're trying to, you know, release a feeling or release a, you know, um, a need or a desire that they, they kind of then work together. Yeah. That's why I was a massive materialist response to, to trauma. Yeah. yeah. Right. So right. A traumatic event happens and then it's, yeah. Can we, how can we put more stuff into this hole that's been created? Right? Yeah. You know, this, this painful. This painful. Yeah. That's right. This painful gap. Well, that that was part of it too. I really, you know, I started to see that this kind of, and 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 Bennett really helped me see that when she she has this whole chapter on, you know, she the electric grid, the failure of, um, you know, the electric grid when it came down in the U.S. I don't know. 10 years ago or something like that. She kind of traces, she calls that an assemblage and she tries to look at ways in which various contributing factors make an assemblage out of that failure. Um, but I thought to myself, oh yeah, that's, you know, she just made me think of electricity as that thing that, you know, leaps from pole to pole, you know, and kind of what is, what in, is engaged in these ephemeral performances is the, the desire to, you know, leap that gap between the human and the divine, or the living and the dead, and uh, you know, it's that liminal space that you know, has to be crossed through. Well, how do we get there? You know, how do we do that? Um, so it, it, it's really also sort of you know, uh, looking at things through their doing more than through their meaning. You know, or, or letting men, I don't want to displace meaning because I love meaning, but, <laughs> but I, I think it is important to you know to also look at what things do. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, hopefully, I can. This will make sense a little bit. And maybe you wrote about this in your essay about ephemera, the burden of ephemera. Uh huh. Yeah. I was wondering what your thoughts were on sort of the interplay of those who maybe like clean up, you know, or to take away this ephemera. I'm sure this was like, you know, like you said, all over Union Square, and I'm sure people, workers came in and oh, yeah. traveled away. Right. All of this and sort of how that fit in 
fits in with like the ephemeral. Oh, that's a really good question. That's a and really who clean, you know, flowers off of graves that are right. Or it's just that's just sort of another like yes, constituent I, or criteria. Yeah. Like, ephemeral is it sort of has to be swept or right right things yeah I mean the, you know there's a whole project around this that would have to do you know in that typology that I was talking about would you know would be you know you'd have a whole category under decay right and how decay figures um, a lot in food flowers things like that um, that eventually rot and have to be, you know, have to be taken care of, as you suggest. Um, so I, I think that that's. I don't have an answer to that. I just think it's a really interesting, interesting question. What happened at Union Square was that um, it rained on September 16th or 17th, like about five days after the event. It rained very hard and all of the memorials that were there, you know, just turned to kind of slush. And the city came through in the night with bulldozer kind of like, you know, uh, pit, you know, what are they called? Not pitchforks, but yeah, yeah, backhoes, kind of something like that. And they just scooped it all up and put it into garbage cans. And that was the city. It was the Department of Sanitation did that because they, you know, they thought that, you know, um, all of that mush was going to just rot and attract vermin and all that kind of stuff. So people just freaked out. They were, and, and by the next day, they were all back again. Yeah. You know, so then it was sunny for a while, and then the rains came again, like maybe a week later, I guess, and the same thing happened. And all these people went down to City Hall and they protested, and there was a, you know, I mean, there was such protection around the desire to keep these you know, to keep these things going, you know. I mean, that was, that was part of the, you know, in hindsight, you know, um, one can look back and sort of say, yeah, I mean, people were, uh, New Yorkers were very dependent on these memorials as, you know, sort of lights in the darkness of the moment that we were all experiencing. And so there was fierce, you know, protest when they tried to take them away. Um, but they made a determination, I think it was in early October, and more rain came and they said no more and they put up barricades at Union Square and Washington Square Park, a few other places as well, and they didn't allow any more making. But the thing that was really interesting to me was that, and the thing that really bugged me too, was that <laughs> at, at Ground Zero, once Ground Zero opened to you know, you could go down, and they, they did many, many things. You know, the memorial and the museum, it took 10 years for it to open. There was nothing there except a big hole. But they had a platform where you could, you know, you could look at, look at the big hole. And it was just very abject. It was horrible. And they just had, but they never, and I wrote letters, you know, the folklorist on the, you know, the city should create a, you know, a place where people, a designated place where people can leave, you know, ephemeral items to recognize their, you know, the presence of, you know, the, um, the dead at Ground Zero and la 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 la. And, you know, because one thing that happened and is still the case today is that, you know, a lot went to the victims' families as it should and all the ceremony, all the pomp, all the annual everything goes to the families of those who died. But those of us who lived through it, you know, made it to the next day and just, and, and really had, you know, some trouble, you know, sort of getting up for a while. You know, we just, we never got to have anything and that just, pissed me off. So I started doing things. I did a whole project at the Brooklyn Arts Council. I had an annual September 11th sing and I had an annual, you know, I did something every year in film or dance or whatever to, to, to give people somewhere to go, you know. Yeah. It was kind of on, on that question, I just wanted to add, Holly Everett is a folklorist. She's at Memorial. Oh, yeah. She wrote a book on roadside trying yeah. and about the, um, the disagreements that HOAs have with their residents. Oh. Yeah. Whether a roadside shrine is a positive element of the community or a negative one. Right. If someone, if a young person had died in a car accident, they would build a roadside shrine and yep. the HOA would clear it away and yep. come back and the HOA would yeah. clear it away. Right, right. I mean, they made, the HOA actually bought like 
the state, like the cross you're allowed to use, like they buy the mailbox you're allowed to use. Yeah. Uh, that that you could do this and that's it. And, and still the folk stuff would creep in. Right, right. But but, but that fight between yeah. to, to, to some people rotting flowers are not rot and decay there. Right. Yeah. Of how long someone has cared. That's right. That's right. That in, as a reference for them. Oh, yeah, that's a very good reference. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, then, and Marsh the Archivist, right? Because so many of those shrines and these uh, assemblages that we're talking about do get archived. Yeah. And in archives, there are things called ephemera. Right. That, you know, are really meant to be not kept around, but they are. And then um, another whole logic is applied. To that, which no, I know it's so interesting. I mean, that's what's happened at the Vietnam War Memorial. You know, I mean, the, they now have moved. I think they're now in their third building. You know, because they collect everything that's left at the Vietnam War Memorial. If it's not, you know, if it's if it's not decayed, if it's an actual thing that they can take, they when they clear it, they clear it, and it's all on these shelves with the, you know, third building. Yes, yes. Um, in June, I was in Miami, Florida, visiting my family, and that was the time that it became more publicly known that um, these refugee children from Central America had been taken away from their families and, and sent to different um, camps or shelters around the country. And um, some artist friends and I learned that um, there was one near Miami in Homestead and that they were keeping over a thousand children there. So the ACLU formed um, a big group and we went and peacefully protested and people brought all kinds of things, teddy bears, a lot of other kinds of toys, things for the children that they obviously knew that the children were never going to receive, but that we set them up around the complex. But it rained. Um, oh right that day, so all the stuffed animals became soggy, and it was kind of sad, but um, shortly after that, I mean, people came back and brought all kinds of things, so it's, I feel like it's almost expected that these things are not going to endure, right. and it's more of that the, the need, that, that, that void is so much bigger than anything, and how people process loss or um, grief um, it changes over time, so you can't really have some solid monument that's going to endure. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. really won't do it. It has to be how you come back with different things or different arrangement of the same things to express where you are at that moment in time in terms of the process of mourning. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally... I totally agree with you. I, I think there's been a real shift. Um, and some of, you know, I, I think to a certain extent, and one thing I didn't talk about today is that, you know, ephemerality has also been embraced as kind of a structure of feeling, right? A, a structure that one can rely on. And the more that one sees it in the media, the more that it becomes, you know, sort of a reflexive possibility for any particular individual, you know, saying, oh, you know, let, let's go and, and, you know, do this. I didn't show you this. Um, there, there's a, a really, really, actually, are the slides still working there? Just flip to, just, yeah, just flip forward. Uh, and and um, these were some I just felt I just didn't have time to get to, but um, this one. So this, this is a little memorial made for um, a, a little boy who was killed in an elevator. He was murdered in an elevator in um, a housing project, in Boulevard Housing Project in Brooklyn two years ago. This happened in 2016. His name was, um, his name was Prince Joshua. And this, this little memorial, it, you know, made out of a hula hoop and just kind of, you know, placed you know, became this site where the entire building complex gathered, you know, to, you know, to mourn his death. And, and so it was, you know, just that it was so, it was so kind of very, very simple, almost nothing, 
all, you know, really, in a certain way. That, but people came around it, and that the things themselves gave, you know, gave people a place to, you know, a place to gather. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, that idea of, you know, the structure of, you know, that ephemerality and the, uh, the, these ephemeral modes of mourning and um, are, are coming into a, a, a status. They're starting to have a status, right? Um, which they didn't have before. It's, it's just, and, and, you know, and my thinking is that September 11th was kind of the tipping point for that. But it's also, you know, that what you tend to see, what I followed too, um, Lord only knows if I'll ever write about it, but I have a huge collection that I've made over the years of the ways in which the media has, you know, given us pictures of these kinds of memorials. This is from the New York Times. I took it this, uh, it's from the Times. So, you know, and one thing that I've noticed is that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, they only gave you the picture of the memorial itself. And then about, I don't know, six or seven years ago, they started more pictures that showed people in the picture, you know, people at the, you know. Um, so, for example, when the Pulse um, mass shooting happened uh, two years ago, the, the pictures in, in the Times were, and in other uh, media outlets too, were all of people in, you know, in front of these, you know, spontaneous memorial things that they had made and that you know with just tons of people gathered around them so, so all of a sudden people are being inserted into the into the picture but I again I think that that adds to the status of the of the form to a certain extent it makes more people agree to themselves that yes I should go or yes I should make one or I should you know participate it does give people a a, an avenue for participating in mourning that has fallen away in the religious structures and social structures of, you know, of life in America. Um, you know, I, I did this big project called Days of the Dead in Brooklyn. I interviewed um, funeral um, directors to get a sense of different expressions, different ways that different cultures in Brooklyn, different kinds of funeral directors, Guyanese or Arab or whatever, how they did their thing. And I was interviewing this Polish funeral director and he looked at me and he said, he goes, is the camera running? Are you running? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's running. He goes, hey, good, because I want to say this. And he goes, he goes, I have this guy call me up, and he was in California. He goes, I got a golf game. Do you think you could hold dad for a couple of days, you know, on ice, you know, while I finish up, you know? And it's Keith Senko, he looks at me and he goes, that's an outrage. He goes, you know, people don't know what mourning is anymore. Mourning used to take place. You got there on the day. It only lasted for three days. You had to be there. You rushed to get there. You made sure you were there. It was your loved one. It was your father. It was your mother. It was... And he just goes on this. He goes off the deep end. He just <laughs> off the deep end. And it's just, it, it's a wonderful performance of someone who firsthand could tell you mourning is like not happening. And then his other thing was, and you'll love this because it kind of fits into the ephemerality thing. It's, um, he goes, so he said, of course, as a funeral director, we do whatever our clients want and, and think that they should have. That's not a problem. And he said, but then again, he looks at me and he goes, but you know what? It's not a celebration of life. I'm against the balloons. I'm against the banners. I'm against the, you know, I don't like all that stuff. He goes, you know, what happened to tears? The veil of tears, you know? He just like, he just was not happy. And I, you know, I was like, I'm with you, Keith. I'm a folklorist. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> yes, yes. So maybe one more question. I don't know, speaking of ephemeral, we were supposed to have some reception, and it's... Cheese, the, the ephemeral cheese. <laughs> the cheese disappeared. I apologize for those of you who came for cheese. Uh, it's, it's gone. Well, the cheese so. stands alone. Yeah, so do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Or stood alone, and then it left. So I'm not a folklore, so I apologize. If That's all right. Okay. So, so what? You what are you? Uh, I'm an economist. Oh, okay. So but he's working on a folklore paper. Oh. Folklore. <laughs> I'm to learn a little bit about it. Okay, but you talked about ephemeral things, the gestures, the objects, mm -hmm. the words, uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. 
to serve that are being used to serve some human need. Mm -hmm. is, does the opposite happen? Is there, you know, how do you call forth the ephemeral, the rainbow, the, the spiritual experience? Right, right. So is, yeah. how does that fit into all this? It seems like it's just the opposite. Well, you know, I, I think what you, I think you used exactly the right, um, the right verb to call forth because I think a lot, oh, for clothes. that's why. <laughs> to call forth, so a calling forth is happening in, in all of these things that I've been talking about. And yes, it does, I think, go both ways. I think the place, you know, if I, if I really had, you know, wanted to, um, y you know, to, to sort of, settle that a little bit, I would have talked more about the way in which the ephemeral is represented in sacred narratives, like of Native Americans. So those rainbows, for example, have, you know, they're in Navajo, they have, you know, the rainbow twins are, you know, they function as ephemeral beings who come and go in the world. They're part of the whole creation and, and they get business done. So they call us and we call to them and, you know, and that's in some of the oldest, you know, you know, story um, of the American continent, um, of the world, really. So, so that kind of calling forth, I think, is very, very old. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I think to a certain extent, I mean, I was talking to um, um, uh, earlier about, you know, what's the oldest thing not the oldest thing is probably graveside, you know, decoration of some kind, you know, because they find that in archaeological sites all the time, remnants of things that have been left in tombs and graves and that kind of thing. So that's again, you know, that place where very early on there there must have been this idea that that those things were, you know that we were calling them, but they were also calling to a certain extent to be, to be the thing, to be the right thing. Because there's a lot of things that could have been chosen, but when you look across the spectrum of things that did get chosen, like flowers or, you know, candles or bones or I don't know, you, you know, it's a limited repertoire. It's a repertoire that to a certain extent is, you know, found throughout the world too. Um, so it, it is interesting to sort of, you know, um, to, to think kind of, I mean, you kind of have to think experimentally um, uh, about how consciousness came into being. One of the things that I'm interested in is another one of those arenas about the altar that I've, you know, that I've kind of tinkered with. But as a folklorist, you know, it's really, it's kind of hard to do. As a folklorist, you're not really supposed to work on stuff that's 5,000 years old. You're supposed to work on stuff that's like five years old or maybe 50 years old. But I've always felt that I was just in Malta um, in June and I, I saw in these beautiful Neolithic um, temples, uh, there were these beautiful altars that were about they looked, they were about the size of this podium. They were standing and they only, and they had, they had decorative, they were like from about 3,500, 4,000 BC. And they were decorated with um, very simple um, um, uh, uh, plant decorations, just little leafy kind of things that were just kind of incised on all four sides. And what could have been put there or burned there, probably they, things were burned, and that's part of that whole thing, you know, that energetic, you know, transformational thing of uh, ephemeral materials, you know, the burning, I didn't even talk about burning that much, I probably should have, but the candle being ignited is, is also part of the, you know, tradition of things that are burned at an altar or, you know, to release energies to, or to gain them, you know, through that, you know, transubstantiation that occurs through through fire but the thing that was so interesting to me about this these beautiful you know altars that I saw in June was you know it did make you think you know every time I kind of encounter these ancient things in up 
front. Um, it makes it does make you think that something was at work, you know, about putting something, taking something from here, putting it there, and you know, thinking about it and you know, enacting something with it, you know. Very, um, there's a, there's a guy, he's an archaeologist, um, I can't call his, I think his name is Sigler. Anyway, he's very interested in, in, in um, early stone tools because he's trying to understand the way that the early creation of a tool could leave a record for the maker that they had made that thing in the past. So when they encountered that tool, again, that little, like a little rock that they had worked on to, you know, that when they came upon it again, they could reflect on it that, oh, I made that in the past. In, at another, you know, they wouldn't have said that. But, but what he was trying to, what he was trying to get at is the way, how does, how do, how do materials give us a sense of consciousness? How do our working with materials in, you know, early human life, how did that, how did that work give us, you know, a, start to open up those pathways to consciousness, the physical manipulation of materials. So, I, and I think that to a certain extent, you know, when you look at these old altars, you know, that again, you know, they look, they don't look that different. I write about that in my book, Beautiful Necessity. Um, I write about the whole consistency of the sort of character and, and look, visual look of altars and the things that are on them. Because I think that, you know, placing something on an altar is automatically a self-reflexive, you know, activity. You know, it's automatically, so you, it's, a, it's an object that you're, you put there and you, you look at it and you do something with it. So it's, you know, it's already coming back to you. You, you know, it's put there so that you'll get something from it, right? So, yeah, it's very interesting. And of course, the, you know, and then you get into the whole birth of, you know, religion. How, how religion starts from, you know, this reflexive, you know, possibility that, again, as I, I think, you know, very much comes out of the material world. I don't know well, if that you. answered your question. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming.